You are creating a survey and you want to create the best survey that you can. You want to ask the right people the right questions in the right way to get information that is truly useful to you, to tell you something that you need to know. You don't want to ask the wrong people. You don't want to ask the wrong questions. What are some techniques that you should know about for improving your survey research? Let me start with an example of what can happen if you ignore paying attention to proper survey strategy. It's World War II. The RAF bomber squadron has returned from a bombing run over Germany. The pilots and flight crews that have returned gather in a dimly lit Quonset hut. And the meeting begins with a moment of silence for the pilots and flight crews that did not return. Then the lieutenant asks, from what direction did the fatal attacks come? And every flight crew responds exactly the same way. We were attacked from above and behind. The lieutenant scribbles this information on a piece of paper, hands it to a corporal and says, take this information to the departing flight crews. It may save their lives. But as the corporal is leaving the dimly lit Quonset hut, a hand reaches from the inky shadows and says, stop. That information could cost lives. What was wrong? with that information. Why could it cost lives? Let's start by thinking about what you want to know. From what direction did the fatal attacks come? But who are you asking? The flight crews who returned. The people who have the information about from which direction the fatal attacks came aren't there to answer the question. We're asking the right question of the wrong people. This is just one way that we can do surveys wrong. Let me show you several examples of bad survey questions and how you could fix them. Mistakes to avoid and fixes that will work to make sure that you make your survey the best that it can possibly be. For this example, I have made up a website. It's mittenkitten.com. It's a source to get mittens and look at cats. Because who doesn't love comfortable mittens and cute kittens? And the website name hadn't been taken, at least not yet. I'm sure by the time you watch this video, someone will have purchased it. Here's the point. We have a survey designer for mittenkitten.com who's not doing a very good job. We're going to find out what's wrong with the questions and how to fix it. Now let me start with something that is potentially not even real research. And it's called push polling. Push polling is asking leading questions. I found this clickable box on a video on YouTube that says, should illegal immigrants be eligible for federal stimulus checks? First of all, I don't even know if certain individuals are eligible for these checks. There is an assumption built into the question that may not even be true. But one thing I do know is that whoever is paying for this clickable link is not interested in your opinion. They are interested in finding people who feel strongly about this issue to click on that link. They are not doing research. They want to find people who will give them information. And I guarantee those people who click on this link and provide their email will be inundated with requests for money. This is a grift. It's not research and it is push polling. However, push polling is sometimes done for less nefarious reasons. For example, how great was your shopping experience today on mittenkitten.com? We are leading or pushing toward an answer about how great the experience was. Here's a much better way of asking that same kind of question. How would you describe your shopping experience with us today? And typically this would be on some kind of Likert scale of one to five or one to seven. Another way that push polls could be asked would be, did you love our wide selection of holiday mittens? Instead, we could ask, how would you rate our holiday mitten selection on a scale of one to 10? Or we could use a dichotomous question like, I was able to find what I needed in the holiday mitten section, agree or disagree. 
Yes, you would love for the visitors to your website to love the website, but you can't get there by telling them to tell you how much they love the website. Now, here's another example of a badly designed survey. And I'll start by saying, I don't know if this is actually true. This is a survey in which a passing grade must be a perfect grade. We can see that for every item, the customer has circled the most extreme answer possible. A non-passing grade, a failing grade would be this. You might first notice that it is exactly the same as the initial survey. Oh, nope. Except for on the second question, the question about overall experience, the customer was very satisfied instead of completely satisfied. If the customer must answer with the most extreme examples, you are getting a constant, not a variable. In statistics, we're measuring variability and it is unrealistic to expect perfection and it's bad statistics. Much better to establish benchmarks. All the grades must be above 80% or a certain percentage of the scores must be above a given point. That is going to give you much more useful data for your survey. Now, this is a good reason why you would pilot test your survey. Sometimes the thing that you think that you are asking is not coming through clearly. You may be asking an ambiguous question. For example, you ask the visitors at mittenkitten.com, would people you know also like our mittens? How are they to respond to that? You could structure this question much better by asking, would you recommend your mittens to our friends? Yes, no. Again, a dichotomous answer. Or you could use a scale, a Likert scale of one to 10, asking the participants, how likely are you to recommend our mittens to your friends? This last example is a surrogate question. You're probably not that interested in how likely someone is to recommend the mittens. You really want to know more about their experience. But the best way to get there is asking, would they recommend? The weakness of a question like this is, I might love a product, but I just don't like recommending it to people. I let people do whatever they want to do. I'm not going to make decisions for them. I love the product. I would buy it again. If someone asked me, I'd tell them how much I love the product, but I'm not going to go around recommending it. This is a weak question, but unfortunately, this is sometimes the best way to get to that type of information. Just remember, it is a surrogate measure. So far, I've been talking a lot about questions, but the answer options that you provide on your survey are just as important. You want to be sure that those answer options are balanced. With unbalanced answer scales, you might ask, how was your shopping experience today? Okay, good, really good, amazing, unbelievable. You see, there's no balance to this. Yes, it is push-pulling, but the lowest available answer option is okay, which means that if someone had a poor experience, there's really no option for them. And everything above that is just some variation of, I really loved it. It's not a balanced answer option. Instead, we should ask, how satisfied were you with your shopping experience today? And the scale runs from very dissatisfied through neutral to very satisfied. And when you are creating those scales, always make the score for the very satisfied the high score and the unsatisfied is your low score. So one would be unsatisfied up to five, which is highly satisfied. That way the thing that you are measuring underneath is satisfaction, where high scores equal high satisfaction. Here's some other examples that I've collected of an unbalanced answer scale. In this example, notice that there is no underlying order to the answer scale. It runs from awesome to wasn't bad to terrible to it was okay. And by the way, what is the difference between it was okay and it wasn't bad? So we have an ambiguity there. You should structure your answer scale on a scale that runs from high to low. And those answers should be arranged in that order. I loved it should be the five and I hated it should be the one. Don't rearrange the order within that scale. Here's another example. What did you think about the length of Samuel Jackson's masterclass? Too long, too short, 
just right, no opinion. The answer scale should run too long, just right, too short. Here are some best practices for your answer scales. Place low sentiment at the bottom, very dissatisfied equals one, and high ratings at the top, very satisfied equals five. Create equally spaced items in the middle, with a middle value being neutral or a balance point. If you do not want to have a balance point, you can use an even number of answers on your answer scale so that there is no neutrality. It is quite possible that there is a question about which you cannot truly be neutral. You might be a little bit on one side or the other, but you can't just truly be neutral. In that case, you would choose an even number of answer points so that there is no middle ground. Another thing to consider is whether the thing that you are measuring has an absolute zero. It can start at nothing and go up to something. Contrast this to a satisfaction scale, which can run from very satisfied through neutrality to unsatisfied. There are some things where there is zero and then there is some measure above that, in which case your answer items might start with zero and increase beyond that because you're measuring from a starting point. Mismatched answer scales occur when the question and the answer options don't line up. Often this will occur when someone is using online survey software and they're allowing the software to just provide the answer options. For example, how easy was it to find the mittens that you wanted? Strongly disagree through neutral to strongly agree. Those answer options don't match up to the question being asked. Instead, we could turn the question into a statement and say, it was easy to find the mittens I wanted, and now the strongly disagree through neutral to strongly agree really makes sense. Be careful too, as you're constructing your answer options, that the options don't overlap. You want people to be in one and only one category. Overlapping answer options occur when you ask something like, how often have you purchased something online this month? And the answer options are zero to one, one to three, three to six, and more than seven. If you had purchased three times, which category are you in? You can't really choose because your answer is in more than one category. The response options must fit in one and only one response category. Here's some other examples that I've discovered in the real world of overlapping answer options. In this case, you're asked to select 1 to 1.5, 1.5 to 2. You can see in every case there is overlap. It is nearly impossible, and the amount of error that is going to be generated in this question is astronomical. It's probably not even going to be a useful question. Now, in this example, we've asked, what are the chances that someone with COVID must be hospitalized? So we're asking about underlying knowledge. What we see is the correct answer is one to 5%, and we can see how people respond based upon their political ideology. The values run from zero, one to five, six to 10, 11 to 19. In this case, we do not have overlapping answer options. And this is the way that the answer options should be constructed. Look out for double barrel questions. A double barrel question asks two things instead of one. And it confuses the test takers and it leaves you with answers that aren't usable. The website was easy to use and the mittens were easy to find. This should be broken down into two separate questions. Number one, we ask, the website was easy to use, agree or disagree. And then we ask a second question. It was easy to find the mittens I wanted, agree or disagree. Another double barreled item that I encountered in the real world and unfortunately did not get a screenshot of said, you have had atrial fibrillation. Is your heart rate controlled and are you taking medications such as warfarin? How are you gonna answer that? Maybe your heart rate is controlled but you're not taking medication. Would you answer yes or no? Or maybe you're taking the medication and yet your heart rate still isn't controlled. This is a double barreled question. 
better to ask two questions instead of one. I've mentioned before that missing data cannot simply be ignored. Sometimes the missing data is the most important information. Therefore, we need to know what to do about and how to recognize non-sampling error that occurs because of non-response error. For example, you are using a survey that measures five constructs using a total of 30 items, each construct being measured by six items. However, when you constructed the survey, you left off one item. You only have 29 instead of 30. This is going to result in missing error. It's the result of test construction, and there's really no way around it. The best you could do, perhaps, would be to average the existing items for that factor, but that is not ideal, and you should note that in the write-up to your report when you explain your findings. Now, another non-response item is processing error. This occurs when the person taking the survey does not understand the item. Perhaps the item itself is confusing, or poorly worded, or a double-barreled item. And so the individual skips that information. Let me show you a very clear example of missing data being incredibly important. This is something that I found over at our university library. There was a big piece of paper asking, we need your input, would you be interested in a games day at the library? And the two options were yes please and please no. And if people answered yes, they could indicate what days would work better for them. What you will note is there are a certain number of people who have answered yes, and no one has answered no. Why is that? Because as people are walking past that piece of paper, if they're not interested in a game day, they don't stop to tell you they're not interested. They indicate their disinterest by walking past and not answering. You don't know the total number of people who are not interested. In other words, you do not have a denominator for this ratio. The best you can do is tell who is interested, or at least how many, and what days, and perhaps that was all the information that the survey really needed to collect. Another survey item that I encountered didn't answer, although this time I did get a screenshot, asks, do you agree or disagree with how local leaders have handled protests in your area? Agree, disagree, neutral. Now you might first notice that it should be agree, neutral, disagree, but given that, how am I supposed to answer this? It's asking about protests in my areas and how the leaders dealt with it. Protests in my area? Were there protests in my area? Maybe. If there were, I didn't know about it. What protests were these? How am I supposed to know whether I agree or disagree with how the leaders handled it? Maybe there were no protests, and so I'm happy that the leaders handled it well. They must have done something right. We didn't have the protests. Or maybe there were protests, and I'm unhappy about they were, how they were handled. You see, the same answer can mean two different things for this item. This is a poorly worded, poorly constructed item. The information gathered doesn't really tell you anything, and that's why I skipped it. So the non-response error here is incredibly high. You will often see non-response error when you are asking people about sensitive topics, such as sex and drugs. If you ask someone, are you on some form of oral contraception? Or do you occasionally use recreational drugs? You will probably see some non-response errors. What do you do with the non-responses? If someone doesn't use recreational drugs, they're more likely to answer, no, I do not. But those who do use recreational drugs may answer yes, or they may simply skip the question. Are the responses in which the individual skips the question responses that really should be a yes, or do we simply not know? Do we split it in half and put half in the yes category and half in the no category? There's really no way to know. This is illustrating why missing data can be so important and give us a distorted picture of the population. 
Sometimes your data are compromised because the answers are not independent. People are answering consistently in the same direction. This is called the halo effect or the horns effect. Let's say you've had an experience and overall you really liked the experience. However, there was that one thing that you didn't really care for. A halo effect would be increasing the ratings because individuals are answering, I loved the experience and they are over rating that thing that they didn't like. We're not getting an honest answer. Let me show you an example of how this happened to me. I went to a presentation about universal design and it was excellent. At the end of the presentation, we were asked to rate how much we enjoyed the presentation. And because I liked it so much, I answered five on every item. I think if I had gone back even 10 minutes later and looked at those items and really thought about them, there would be some that I liked more than others. And I would rate them accordingly. But this is an example of a halo effect. Because I liked the overall presentation, I rated all of the items extremely high. The horns effect would be just the opposite. Overall, you had a decent experience, but there was one thing that you disliked or really hated, or maybe you want to punish the organization with a lot of low ratings. And so everything gets a rating of one, even though if you were honest about it, you didn't hate everything, there was that one thing that colored the overall experience. I hope that these examples of non-sampling error can help you to design an excellent survey. It's important that we collect data well, asking the right people the right questions in the right way. And if you can avoid some simple mistakes, it's going to make your research all the better.